Well, brethren, some people think that the subject of God's law is boring or burdensome. But that's not how the Holy Scriptures presents it. If you are, are a sola scriptura type of person, and what you read in the Bible is more important to you than what the Pope or some Sunday televangelist has to say, then you'll notice this testimony by a man after God's own heart, what he had to say about why it's important to study and think about God's divine law. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 19 and verse 7. Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7. I'm going to read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. Instruction here is Strong's 84:51. It's the word is in Hebrew is Torah, which the, you know, the great commentary of Brown, Driver, and Briggs defines in English that means direction, the direction of the Lord, the instruction of the law, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's renewing one's life. Then David goes on to say, the testimony, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Now the testimony here is strong 5715. It's a dooth. It's and it refers very specifically to the testimony of the ten words, that is the Ten Commandments on the tables, okay, that were given as a solemn charge to the children of Israel. And it also means, according to the lexicon, it's the code of law in general, the testimony, the aduth. It's a witness from God. But it says, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperiences the way the Holman Christian Standard Bible translates it. But you know, it's usually in most translations, you'll see the simple. And you know, the lexicon offers the idea of the open-minded. And you know, really, from that standpoint, that is the best selection because it, when you say the, the testimony of the Lord, okay, is trustworthy, making the open-minded wise, well, that's more of getting what is point because the scriptures are only going to benefit you if you're open-minded. If you're closed-minded, if you've all, I don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. I already know. I've already made up my mind. If you're not open-minded, it's not going to make you wise because you won't be willing to learn from it. You know, and then that's very important. In verse 8 here in Psalm 19, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The precepts here, this is strong, 6490. Pikud, it's also the precepts, you could say the statutes. It's, the word is equally a good choice, according to the lexicon. The statutes of the Lord are right. They're not wrong. David says the statutes of the Lord are right. Meaning that this is, these are the specific things that God would say. You know, I want on this specific thing, you have the Ten Commandments and you have the statutes which tend to break it down finer. How does it apply? And God would give his statute. He'd tell Moses how to write it down. The, the precepts or statutes of the Lord are right. What do they do? Make the heart glad. Then he goes on, the command of the Lord is radiant, making the lie, eyes light up. The command here, this is Strong's 4687, it's mitzvah. You've probably heard of mitzvah. If you've, if you've ever talked to a Jew, they might talk about a mitzvah. But it's the command or mitzvah, which is God's commandments, his duties, okay, his duties that he gives a man, a person. The command of the Lord is radiant. It's not burdensome. It's not, oh, it's terrible. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. 
Here, this word is, the fear is strong, 3374. It's not normally what the way we think of fear. It's an old, fat, old English concept. The fear of the Lord means the reverence or piety of, you know, for the, the piety of the Lord. The reverence. In other words, we, with the word of God, we, you know, we hear the testimony, what God has to say, and we respect it. We say, wow. It has a special place in our life. The reverence or piety of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. So it says, reflects an attitude, doesn't it? Then it go, David goes on, the ordinances, okay, and here's the Strong's word 49 and 41. It's mishpat, which means judgment or justice. It would be our equivalent, if I was a lawyer in the society, I would say it's our case law. In English uh, common law, case law, you build one thing or another, this is how it's judged, this is how it's judged, or some issue comes up specifically, and this is the judgment. You know, the, he, he, David is saying the ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than the abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey which comes from the honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them. There is great reward in keeping them. That's what David, a man after God's own heart, had to say. A lot of people don't agree with David. A lot of religious people these days. They really don't. They totally disagree with David. But the people of God who have reverence, who fear the Lord, who have piety for their creator and his witness, his Torah, his instructions, his testimony, his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, well, those who have reverence for them, they're going to listen to them. They're going to be open-minded, and they're going to become wise by listening to these things. And to do them, the scriptures make a very strong point. To do them means to choose a good life, a good life rather than an eventual meaningless death, or the sensation of any sort of conscious existence. God holds out these things. You know, you do these things, there's life, you, you go, there's, it's going to mean everything to your life. You don't do them, there's bad things that's going to happen to you. God asks us, you know, he, 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 it, I want to make this point that's very clear because a lot of people get confused on the law of God. God saves his people by grace. Go to Ephesians 2, 4. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. The Holman Christian Standard Bible saying with it, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. <laughs> we were dead because, as the apostle John said, what is sin? Sin is a transgression. It's the trespass of the law. It's the trespass of the Torah. <laughs> we were dead in those things. Even though that you were dead in trespasses, trespassing the law, you are saved by grace. But when God saves us by grace, he then asks us to walk with him in newness of life. Let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. And staying with Apostle Paul here, follow what he has to say. Ephesians 4, 17, and of course Ephesians were not Jews. No, they grew up in a pagan society, much like our society today, which turned its back on the truth revealed by the God of the Bible. Ephesians 4, 17, Therefore I say this, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as Gentiles walk. Don't walk as people, as the, you know, people who were not of the children of Israel, who didn't have the Torah, who didn't have the statutes, who didn't have the judgments. Don't walk like these people. Don't live like them. The morality of the Greco-Roman Empire can be read, you know, in many historical sources. And they were, you know, that's how the Gentiles walked. You shouldn't walk that way if you're a Christian. 
Paul is saying that to these people. You should no longer walk as all these other Gentiles who don't know God, who don't know God's laws, who don't know what the Bible has to say. Don't walk with them in futility. That's strong 3153. It's metaiotis. It's aimlessness due to lack of purpose or any meaningful end. Don't walk because, you know, in a way that there's no meaningful end. Don't walk in a way that's nonsense because it's all just transitory. That's futility. See, that's what our world is embracing right now. The values of this world are futility. The metaotes, they're aimless, they're lacking purpose, they don't have a meaningful end, they're nonsense because it just fades away. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as Gentiles walk in futility. Futility of their, okay, turn the page. Uh, stick page. Futility of their thoughts. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. Because they're walking in the futility of their thoughts, their understanding is darkened. They're not getting it straight. They are excluded. That means they are or alienated or estranged from the life of God. Those who are living as the Gentiles, to those who don't know the testimony, who don't have the Torah, the teaching, the instruction of God, they're walking knowing the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They're excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance. Now, this is a great word. Strong's 52, agnoia, from which we get the word agnostic. Because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge, ignorance, especially of divine things, the lexicon says. Sometimes it includes the idea of willful blindness, says the lexicon. Now, there are a lot of people who are willfully blind these days. There really are. In the mainstream media, they are willfully blind. And most of our leaders and politicians are willfully blind. Now, some aren't but they're almost all ignorant. They're because of the agnoia, the ignorance that is in them, and because of the hardness of their hearts. It's like Pharaoh's heart was hard. He saw all these miracles, he saw the hand of God, he saw what was going to, and yet he couldn't care less. And that's the way much of our, those who are leading us today are. They have such a hatred for Christianity, it's positively amazing. Yes, being a Christian these days and, and throughout much of this world is one of the most dangerous things you can do. They are, Christians are, you know, there was a great report I read this, no, great, but a report this week talking about the level of persecution of Christians throughout this world. It's, it's astounding. And in the West, you know, it's, it's oftentimes, you'll see people turn the cold shoulder. They try to exclude you. They don't want to promote you if you're in jobs and things like this. They're, you know, you're, you're giving a hard time. This is, this is going on in the world. It's there. It's, it can be quantified. So Paul was saying, therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as a Gentiles in their fertility of their thoughts. They are darkened into their understanding and excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. We can't be like those people. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be like the world around us because the world around us, is, you know, they are walking in the darkness and ignorance of their thoughts and the hardness of their hearts. God's Torah, his instructions, his testimony, his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, all these were given to help the people of God in their relationship with him.
and with each other and with people in general. They are essentially God's Torah, his statutes, his judgments. They are God's essential principles for living. They are his essential principles of living. They're part of what I call moral logic of the universe. They've been around from the very beginning. Moses just got around to putting them down at the time he did. But they've, they've been around for a long time, ever since the creators started making this world. Now, when we talk about the law of Moses, people tend to have a very strict, limited view of the subject. They want to define, oh, this is part of the law of Moses, this is not, and this is this. But that's not really what the scriptures say. That's not what the Bible is saying when it talks about the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And that means everything in them. That's the teaching. That's the testimony. That's the witness. Now, almost all Bibles that you pick up and will read will have a title on that first book in the Bible, in the first book in this book of books, and it's going to say the first book of Moses called Genesis. Okay, because it's part of the Torah, it's part of the law, it's part of the witness, it's part of the testimony. Now the point I'm making is that God gives his testimony, his witness through actual, the actual personal experiences of the lives of his people that are recorded in the pages of your Bible. He also has given specific inspired commands, judgments, statutes in various places in the Law of Moses and the books of such as in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. But in Genesis, you find a lot more personal stories. You find lots of personal stories, too, in the other books there of, of, of Moses, but particularly in Genesis. And they're meant to help guide our lives. Now, Noah is one of these. You know, Jesus talked about the weightier matters of the law being justice, mercy, uh, and faith. Now, let's take a look at the example of, of, of Noah and see how some of the weightier matters of the law, of the teaching of God's witness, his testimony, how this is brought out. Let's go, and we'll, 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 we'll just go through here real quickly if we can. And let's go through the book of Genesis and take a look a little bit and see, you know, perhaps you had, perhaps you one of the people who've had a very narrow and limited view of what you think the law of Moses is about. And maybe we can open your minds. If you're open-minded, you see, the scriptures, they, they, they're, they're there to help those, but you have to be open-minded about it. See what it has to say. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, and let's go to verse, oh, verse 28. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. Well, I'd like to be 182 years old and begat a son. That would be great. I'd really, you know, go for it. There's, that's a long story anyways. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one shall comfort us in our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Of course, that is a story that goes back even further because of Adam and Eve's transgression. They disobeyed God's direct command. They had seen the God of the, their creator, the God of the Bible, the pre-incarnate Christ, if you believe what Jesus says about himself and about what the Gospels say about Jesus. And the ground had, he had got, you know, God had pronounced a curse on it because of their transgression. It was going to make man work hard. <laughs> keep him, he was going to keep him busy. But he called his name Noah, you know, which is pleasant, is peaceful, it's, it's comfort. See, this is, this is oftentimes they do name, they have this. And after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years, you know, and he had lots more children. There were a lot more children than just Noah. And then he died, and Noah was, verse 32, verse 32, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth. He was 500 years old. That wouldn't be, wouldn't that be great? 
essentially, you know, when we when we look at this, the 500, that's almost inconceivable to us right now because this is not our experience in this world. We think, wow, how could somebody live to be 500 years old? But the thing is, things have changed, and God shortened man's lifespan, and we'll see a part of the reason why here very shortly. But when he originally made man, there weren't those sorts of limits. And the world wasn't polluted and corrupted like it is now, perhaps the radiation even levels and the, or the what used to filter out the harmful radiation from the sun that breaks down our cells. Maybe that was filtered out more in the previous. But anyways, let's go, this is fame. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's go to bound here, Genesis 6, Genesis 6 and verse 5. You're going to see something here. There was a problem. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord repented that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Like any father, he sees his children, and they disobey him in everything and do everything he doesn't want them to do and won't do what he does want them to do. It's very clear, very, very simple. And their imagination of their hearts were only evil continually. Man. If you go on the internet, you can see all the evil that people do. It's just astounding what people are doing these days. I'm not going to go into discussing their examples. But they're out there. And it's, it's really horrendous. And the Lord repented that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved at the heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the crawling thing and the fowl of the air, for I repent that I have made him. I am so upset and angry <coughs> at what I've done. I'm going to undo it all. I'm going to just wipe it all out, do something else. But then we see this in verse 8, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, here we are in the Torah of Moses. And we're talking about what? Grace. The way to your matters of the law. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 8. Hebrew word is um, Strong's 2580. It's chen. It's favor. It's grace. It's very simple. It's nothing you earn. It's nothing you know, but it's, it's, it's something on the part that God extended it. He felt that he, you know, extended himself. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. Now these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect. Perfect from the standpoint, the Hebrew, uh, the word, it, in the, it means in English, sound, complete, blameless, sincere, undefiled. For Noah was undefiled in his generations. Maybe that means that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were normal kids. <laughs> they weren't all screwed up with all sorts of sexually transmitted diseases or whatever it might have been. We don't know all the things, but this God was making a point. We're only now getting to be understand genetic manipulations within the last generation or so. But whatever it is, or whether he's just talking, obviously he's a righteous man, he's a Sadiq, he's somebody who is following what God felt was his, you know, his moral logic of the universe that he had talked to Adam and Eve and his successors about. He looked at you know he looked at Noah and he and it's 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 here that Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations for Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. He wasn't walking in the futility of his mind like the other Gentiles. Yeah, he wasn't a, Noah wasn't an Israelite, but he wasn't walking like everybody else in humanity who was disgusting God because their imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. That's not what God wanted. That's not what God wanted. Now let's go down to verse 13.
And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Wow. So God is going to take action. He, you know, from time to time, and you'll see this when you read the scriptures, and God talks about the fact that when he's had enough, he's had enough. He's, God is patient, but there's time he says, mm, there is a limit on this. You know, I've got a date. I've got a due date here. I've established something. And he's, he's telling Noah that he, what his plans are. He's sharing with him what his plans are. And then he says to him in verse 14, he gives him a commission. He gives Noah something specifically to do. Okay, in his situation, at his time, in his place, he says, make an ark of cypress tempers, of uh, timbers. You shall make rooms in the ark, and you shall pitch it inside and outside with pitch. You know, I know there's a guy, you know, I think it's in Kentucky, he's built up a big tourist attraction to show people. And, you know, this is the kind of thing people look at it. And these days people laugh. They've made movies about it, you know, which are generally corny as all get out and inaccurate as all get out. But, you know, the point is, is that God saw the situation. He was going to do something. He said to this person, Noah, who had found grace in his sight. He said, okay. I want you to do this. I want you to make this ark because I'm going to take care of this situation. I am going to resolve it. And you see here when he tells, and he tells him to, to he's going to pull in all these animals and make sure you gather all the food. I mean, this is an enormous undertaking that he, he, he took Noah in. It's not something you did overnight either. Okay, he, I mean, it was going to take him 100 years to do it essentially. <laughs> so it was a long time to do what God had to say. And he had to do it, as, you know, oftentimes to ridicule. I mean, building an ark in the middle of whatever, and, you know, the t people, he, people would have thought he was crazy, this religious kook, this nutty guy. But it says here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, in spite of the mockery of everyone around him, and probably his own family occasionally must have thought he was nutty too. But it says here in verse 22, or not, Noah did so. He did what God asked him. He did so according to all that God commanded, so he did. What an example. Noah did so. Noah didn't just say, I love God and I'm going to do as I please. <laughs> <laughs> like people today, a lot of people will say, you know, you know, with their lips, I love God. Oh, hallelujah, I love God. And then they go out and do what they please and they ignore what God says. Not good. Not good. Noah's example in what the Torah is teaching you, what the law of Moses is teaching, that when God says, you know, gives you says some duties to do, Noah did so according to all that God commanded him, so he did. That's the example. If you're open-minded, you'll hear it. Genesis 7 and verse 1. Genesis 7 verse 1, And the Lord said to Noah, You and all your house shall come in unto the ark, for you I have seen righteous before me in this generation. So then he's looking at all the people who arrived in this generation of these people that I created and made Okay, I'll, I'm going to spare you. You found grace in my sight. Let's go down here to verse 5. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And it repeats it one more time. <laughs> you know, it's practically, you know, Moses, when he was writing this down, I guess God was dictating it. And God was making a point. See, it was God making a point for those who are open-minded, who do have reverence for his word. God did, Noah did, according to all that the Lord commanded him. And it says here, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters began upon the earth. So, you know, he started when he was 500. Now he's 600 and he's got sons and to help him do all this. But he's having to do this a long time. He was 600 years old when the flood of waters began upon the earth. 
He had to put up with people's mocking for over a hundred years and saying, you're crazy. What a crazy kook this guy is. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Then it says this, notice this, of the clean animals and the animals that were not clean. Oh, we're talking about clean and unclean food of what's proper for human beings to eat and it's always clean animals and unclean animals where we see there is a moral logic god created them for beginning obviously for a purpose they were created for man's use appropriately and you know god isn't going to tell us and he doesn't tell us right here he doesn't define everything he doesn't give us all the details that's later in the torah Someplace else, you go to Leviticus 11. He's going to define it very clearly. But for, for Noah's purposes, it was oral and he just said. But you see here the whole concept was in existence long before Mount Sinai and what a lot of people try to limit as the law of Moses. They don't look at it as, as an entirety. This is a cr tremendous mistake among many people who call themselves Christians. So let's go to Leviticus and, uh, I mean, excuse me, Genesis chapter 7, and let's go to verse 11. Uh, Genesis 6, 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on this day, which is amazing, <clears throat> Noah obviously had a calendar too. <laughs> Noah had a calendar. <clears throat> That's what it says. On this day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken open, and the windows of the heaven were, were opened. And the rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. We think we have flood problems <laughs> this year. I mean, we the, the snow has melted very fast, and places like in Montreal and other places have had a lot of flooding. Even where my oldest son lives in the Okanagan, they've had a certain amount of flooding. But it's nothing like compared to what these people were going to face. Genesis 7 and verse 13, on that same day, on this day that he, you know, what he says, uh, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that same day, Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of, the, of his sons with them entered into the ark. They entered into the ark. And they went in and every animal after its kind and all the livestock after their kind and every creeping thing that crawls upon the earth after its kind and every fowl after its kind, every bird of every sort. They went to Noah into the ark, two by two, of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. And they entered, and they went in, male and female of all flesh, as the Lord had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut him in. And then we see here, if we drop down, we just go to verse 23, verse 23. And every living thing which was upon the face of the earth, that wasn't in the ark, that Noah had built, because he followed God's command. He followed the commission that God had given him and obeyed him and actually did what he said. And every living thing that was upon the face of the earth was destroyed from man to livestock and to the crawling things and the fowls of the heavens. And they were destroyed from the earth and only Noah remained alive and those that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Let me see here this in verse eight in chapter eight, verse one. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. Verse six, verse six. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven. And it kept going out and returning until the waters were dried up from off the face of the earth. See, Noah was smart. 
he, he was letting somebody do the legwork for him. You know, he was, he was waiting to see, you know, what, was it really safe? Was it really time to leave? Verse 11, and so, and finally he sent out a dove, and the dove came to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew the waters had gone down from off the face of the earth. But he waited yet another seven days. <laughs> Even then, the experience had been, to say the least, traumatic. He was being careful. God didn't fall in fault with the fact that he was careful. In verse 18, And Noah went out, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, and every animal, every fowl, and every crawling thing, all that crawls upon the earth after their families went forth out of the ark. And it says here in verse 20, And Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took every clean of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered a burnt offerings upon the altar. He took into the ark more than one pair of clean animals, by the way. You find how this makes a point. But you see here very clearly the Bible is talking, again, of something that would be later you know, explicated in greater detail much later in the Law of Moses and, and as I said, Leviticus 11. So let's drop down to chapter 9 here in verse 1, pick up the story. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the air and upon all that moves on the earth and upon all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. We have stewardship over the living things of the earth. We have stewardship. And everything that lives shall be food for you, even as the green herb that I have given you in all things. God would define that. He did define that. Noah obviously knew it at the time because he knew the difference between clean and unclean. And he would define it later. But anyways, we, we will, you know, it's from this aspect. And you see very clear, well, we won't get into that subject. But of course, even the disciples knew that. But he comes down here in verse 4. But you shall not eat of flesh with the life in it, which is the blood. You're not supposed to eat. When you, when you eat some sort of flesh, you don't eat it with the blood. You're supposed to drain the blood out. And that's defined again in greater detail in Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 to 11. And the curious thing is, is that later on, the church, you see in Acts 15, one of the things that they wrote to the Gentile converts, he, they wanted to make sure they knew that they were not to eat the blood. And they mentioned this, Acts 15.20 and Acts 15.29. They repeated this part of the law of Moses because they wanted them very specifically because Gentile society, they eat blood all the time. It was part of, you know, it's part of what they did. Just like people eat blood sausages today, mostly in Europe. God said not to do it, and the church repeated it, not to do it. And you know, most people don't even bother. Most people, from this standpoint, they don't think about it. But in verse 5, or we'll pick this, continue on Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. Surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. He's telling this to Noah, but he's going to explain it and repeat it to the, you know, to the children of Israel. After his giving the Ten Commandments of Mount Sinai, he talks about in Exodus 21, 28, about various, he gave specified for a nation, because that's what was delivered there after Genesis, after Exodus 20, was the laws and statutes for a nation. He was what to do about if you had problems with animal control with with animals killing people, and in this case, an ox with horns. And he's also he goes on and he's going to demand a reckoning and from the hand of man. Oh, he didn't want murderers just around, running around either. He was, he, and you can see in the law of Moses defined between who is a murderer who would be 
uh, considered a manslaughterer, somebody who would kill somebody and would not be immediately killed. And he, he, he went through all the rules of how the nation was to deal this, deal with it. And then he says, he's, you know, demand a reckoning, from the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. This statement here in Genesis chapter 9 in verse 5 is one of the reasons, and I've, I've always taught this, of why we who are Christians in the church of God, we don't believe in euthanasia. We don't believe in mercy killing. You have also the whole example of, of uh, an Amalekite who performed a mercy killing on Saul on the field of battle when, it, when he thought he was uh, going to die and probably was and wanted to get his life over with quickly. You see in 2 Samuel verse one, verses 1 to 14, this whole incident that would later be repeated in the scriptures showing that this sort of mercy killing was not tolerated. David, a man after God's own heart, wouldn't tolerate it. Because it says here in Genesis 9 and verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Hearkening back right to the creation. The whole purpose of why he did this. There is a moral logic that has gone on from the very beginning. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. In verse 8, then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him saying, as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. See, God gave the covenant by grace. They didn't buy it. There's nothing they could give God to bargain for it. God established a covenant is, is a relationship, just like you have a marriage covenant between a man and a wife. It's a relationship that's going to develop and continue on. And he's saying to, to Noah and his sons, I'm going to establish my covenant with you and with your sons after you because this is God's long-term plan. And you notice this is curious. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. I think this is interesting. We oftentimes overlook at it because uh, you know, we, sh we shouldn't put down the whole idea of being the fact that we are stewards, we should have a good environmental stewardship of how we take care of this creation. And God's concerned about the animals. You notice later on in the prophets, he's going to talk about it in Jonah 4.11 when, you know, Jonas would, would have just sort of preferred that Nineveh, which is the capital of the, of the Syrian empire, who are enemies of the Israelites, he would have preferred that they get wiped out that they would be, you know, that God would drop fire and brimstone on them. But he says, you know, God, seeing the hardness in Jonah's heart, said to him in Jonah 4, 11, and should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, that it sent you to, to preach the repent, and they actually did. <laughs> they actually heard you. Surprise! In which there are more than 120,000 men who do not know between the right and left hand. See, they were ignorant. They were ignorant. They didn't know. And God was having mercy on them. And then he adds, besides much livestock. See, he, I'll establish my covenant with you and your descendants, as well as every living creature that is with you. God keeps his word. Verse 11 here in Genesis. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every loving creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be a sign for the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and the flesh of all flesh that is on the earth. You know, I think it's a curious irony. Here we are in the 21st century that the gay rights community has adopted the rainbow as one of their main symbols. 
Are they using it as an unconscious, perhaps, talisman against divine judgment? I don't want to answer that. <laughs> Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 13. Now, what is the teaching? What does this whole example of Noah tell us that's in the law of Moses? What is, what is, it, what is it warning us of? In Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel says this in chapter 14, verse 13, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness. See, the world of Noah's time, talk about persistent unfaithfulness. It was the imagination of their hearts were only set on evil. It was full of violence. When a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness. Sounds like what's going on in Canada and the United States of America right now and most other places in the world, right? It does. I will stretch out my hand against it and I will cut off its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off man and beast from it. God is saying to Ezekiel that he's going to discipline them, but he's not going to do it by flood of waters, is he? No, he, prom he had a promise, and he, he remembered his promise. Even if these three men, Ezekiel 14, 14, good, good memory verse, even if these three men, Noah, he starts with Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, that are in this land that is, you know, turned against me by persistent unfaithfulness, even if Noah, Daniel, and, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. They're not even, you know, if you don't even have the situation, God was merciful to Noah. He allowed him to have his wife and his, his sons and their, and their wives. Verse 15, if I cause wild beasts to pass through a land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beasts, we haven't had something like that for a long time, although there are times when we've had diseases. Remember, the Spanish flu killed 100 million people <laughs> in 1918. I, I've got a letter from my grandfather talking about how terrible it was. Anyways, says the Lord, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered, and the land would be desolate. You know, ultimately, hope, the point is that no one can ride on the coattails of another person. It's our own personal standing before God that's going to count. Where if I bring a sword against that land, sword go through the and I say, sword go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves would be delivered. Where if I send a pestilence into the land, like Spanish flu, and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God. They would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. This is what he says in the prophet Ezekiel. It's a warning to us. It's a sober warning. And he's, the prophet is using the, these examples. Let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 17. We see in the New Covenant Scriptures, Jesus, of course, was fully aware <laughs> of the story of Noah, obviously. Luke 17, verse 26, he says this, prophesying of the end days, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus validates the whole story in Genesis. Likewise, as it was also said in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, and they bought, and they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So even it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Sober thoughts, what Jesus left to his church and his people to think about. Let's go to 1 Peter and the general epistles. Let's go to what is common by Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter. First.
1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 3. And he talks in verse 17, he bring, to bring it up for it is better if it is the will of God for you to suffer while doing good than to suffer for doing evil. Because Christ indeed once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. On the one hand, he was put to death in the flesh, but on the other hand, he was made alive by the Spirit. Then we have verse 20, he talks about, well, verse 19, he talks about, by which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He's preached to the spirits in prison. We're going to hear about that in a second. Which disobeyed in time past when once the long suffering of God was waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. See, there was once a world in which people were disobedient. Their, their minds were darkened by their ignorance. They were darkened by their ignorance to the moral logic of the universe, of what they should have known, of what somebody like Noah did remember and did bother to pay attention to. And God, he said, the divine long-suffering waited in these days while the ark was being prepared. Is God having long-suffering waiting in our times for this? Let's go to the next epistle of Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Peter says this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, and so there's a long backstory to the history of this creation and man's appearing on this earth. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but having cast them into Tartarus is what it actually says in the scripture. Many versions will say hell, but you know, Tartarus in the Greek is a place of restraint or imprisonment. So it's, if you're having angels, it's obviously not your physical prison. It's something different. But that's how it puts it. He cast them into Tartarus and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be kept for judgment, reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world. See, Peter is making this warning and advising the brethren to pay attention to this. But save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them example of those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by their filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And what they were doing, their lawless deeds, were contrary to the law of Moses. God talks about all sorts of things in the law of Moses about sexual immorality. He defines it pretty, you know, breaks it down into fine points. All the different ways one can sin that God found was defiling. Verse 9, it says, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Verse 10, especially those who walk according to the flesh in corrupting lust. This is Strong's 3394, miasmos. This is a, of an act of defilement or pollution. In, at the time of Noah, the world was defiled because these people were only thinking about what was wrong and evil, and it was full of violence. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in corrupting violence and hold in utter contempt the lordship of God. See, God... The Apostle Peter was inspired to say that, you know, he's linking that those who walk, there, you have corrupting lust, and at the same point, they hold in utter contempt the lordship of God. The lordship of God, Strong's word here is 2963, it's curiotes, it's from curios, Lord. And it's talking about the Lord's 
a dominion, that his power that he has over in a particular jurisdiction, which in this case is the earth and humanity, his creation. But many people are walking according to the flesh and corrupting lust and hold in utter contempt the lordship of God. That is the nature of our society. And God defines these things and shows us through the law of Moses the consequences of these things and what the errors were. In five books there, God repeats it time and again. Noah, then you have the whole thing of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the kicking out the Canaanites out of Canaan before the Israelites. You have all these things. Let's go to Matthew 23, 23. For people who have a problem, and there are many who have a problem with the law of Moses these days. Jesus said this, however. He said, Woe to you! How terrible it would be for you, those who are teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees of his, of his day. Why? You are hypocrites. That is, you say you represent yourself to be one thing, but you're just a play actor. You're not doing it. You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. And that's the problem right now. Most in the religious world, there are lots of people who talk the talk. I love God, but I want to do as I please. I don't want to listen to, I don't have any reverence for the word of God. I don't have any reverence. I despise the lordship of Jesus Christ to tell me what is right and wrong. I want to do my own thing. You hypocrites. You give to God one-tenth, that is, you pay tithes on everything you have, even the mint, dill, and cumin, your garden herbs, but you don't obey. Or as the expanded Bible version says, you know, they obey, you ignore, you neglect. Now those have different, you know, you don't obey sounds active, but if you ignore, it sounds a little bit more passive aggressive you neglect well you know whatever it is that won't cut it with god you don't obey <laughs> you're ignoring or neglecting the really important teachings of the law of the law of moses which include justice god was going to bring justice upon the earth in noah's day mercy Noah found grace in God's sight and being loyal. Yeah, he was he's faithful. Noah did what God asked him to do. These are the things you should do. Okay, all you know, these these weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith, without neglecting even to tithe. Oh. And, of course, tithing is defined and, t and talked about significantly of tithing of year increase. It gives all sorts of different examples in the scriptures. Of course, I know all these people these days say, well, I only tithe on agricultural produce if I have land and these other things. And I, uh, the, the scriptures won't let you off so easily. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. We'll conclude today's message this, this new covenant scripture Hebrews chapter 11 let's go to verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen right? Hebrews is making a point our faith is a conviction, is a substance of what's being hoped for, of what the Bible promises. Conviction of things not seen. And by this kind of faith, the elders obtained a good report. And then again, let's go down to verse 7. Hebrews 11 and, and verse 7. By faith, Noah, after being divinely instructed by God, about things he could not yet see, was moved with fear and prepared an ark for the salvation of his house. 
and all the other living things. Because it wasn't a small rowboat or a yacht. It was this enormous ark in which he was carrying all these animals. And you worked on it for a hundred years with seeing no evidence that anything was going to happen. And he was moved with fear and prepared an ark for the salvation of his house, through which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. What an example of the law of Moses.